Uh, now, um, Rafe and I are going to talk in two parts about data collection for herps, but hopefully what we'll talk about will also be relevant just to begin thinking about, you know, how to use some of these tools for documenting other groups of animals. Uh, and actually, based on what Jacob said, I will spend a, a brief interlude to talk about a sort of a broader, flexible system for observational data, too, that's not specifically bird-based. So for pretty much everything that we're going to do in the field related to amphibians and reptiles, the single most important identifier of those specimens is the field number. And so that is these little paper tags, which on one side have a number and on the other side have initials of some kind. In this case, DCB are my initials. That's it. We don't write large tags that are tied to specimens in herpetology that have lots of data associated with that number. We don't, we don't do that on the tag itself. We do that in our notebooks and then in our databases that we build. Each of these specimens, so Mark showed you a paper tag that had a space that was the field number and then there's a blank spot left on those tags, right, that later on is filled in with the institutional number, right, so then they, in the University of Kansas collection, when it comes back and is cataloged in that collection, it's given a second number that's so you have the field number and then a second number is the collection number for the institution. Because some of our collections in the field will go to multiple institutions. So Rafe and I, when we work together on this trip and collect amphibians and reptiles, those will go both to the University of Kansas and to the California Academy of Sciences. And so they'll have a, possibly a common set of field numbers and then separate numbers in two different institutions. And so um, those in herpetology, they have one tag that's the field number, and then later on in their history, those specimens are then given a second piece of paper, a second paper tag that has the institutional number here being something like this for the California Academy of Sciences. All right, so that, I'm just going to begin with that, and I'm going to come back to field numbers in a second. But just to say that, you know, we use these field numbers in our catalogs, right? There's a DCB number, there's DCB is my initials for the field tag numbers, and then that's how we organize all the data, which I'll come back to later. So first I'm going to take just a brief comment just to really uh, talk about taking, having a camera, taking pictures. And so um, really I, it can't be... Um, underemphasized how important having a camera with you in the field is. And I'm going to talk a little bit about types of cameras here in a moment, but one of them is just simply having a camera with you while you're out in the field is really important, right? That's how you can document those observations that Jacob mentioned. I mean, yes, they can be site observations, but those observations are even better if there's a picture, right? And for plants and for amphibians and reptiles, small mammals, flowers, whatever you want, a picture of that observation is actually really important. And now there's cameras that one, you can set the date and time, right? So if, if you are taking field notes and you can associate your field note with a date and a time, your camera is also tracking the date and the time when it's taking pictures, right? So it's, it's easy to go back and integrate between your you know, pictures you've taken while you're out in the field with your field notes. There's also now photographs, or also cameras that have a GPS built into them. And so, come back into frame. So, you know, this little camera that I'll, you'll see me use in the field takes GPS data while I'm taking pictures, right? This is a waterproof camera. It's shockproof for the most part. Hopefully it didn't just break. Um, but it's, it's waterproof, it's shockproof, it takes GPS data. And this, these little cameras, you know, they, they might cost $200 or more, a little more, um, but they can get you a phenomenal amount of data while you're out in the field, right? And I'll show you just some of the examples of things that we do with them. Uh, and I like them because I can fit them in my pocket, so I tend not to forget them like I forget my larger camera. So, you know, it's really nice to take images and photos when you can because you never know what nature is going to present you with, right? So, for instance, just on the side of the road uh, in southern Cameroon, we were able to see these. And this is a foam nest of chiromantis, which is a racophorid tree frog that we'll see while we're here, hopefully. Uh, and they make these really nice foam nests that are just over puddles like this. And, you know, this is the type of thing that we don't see very often in the field. Um, we sometimes encounter them, but if we don't have a camera with us, you know, we don't get to document the fact that this frog was breeding at this time of year, right? And that's really important biological data. The other is that, um, hope, let's see if this will work. Oh, let me go back. Um, I have to turn on my sound. 
So we can also do things like uh, taking calls. And so this is also valuable, right? Because my camera is recording the time and the date. And it also has, I can record movies, right? And so this is a video, but you wouldn't know it because my headlamp is off. At the very end, I can turn on the headlamp and I can see the frog and I can take the frog and put it in a bag and put it with a field number. And now I have a video. There's that frog, it's a little hyperoleus from Cameroon. So now I have you know, the date and time that it called and I have a video of it and I have the sound of it. And that type of information can be really valuable, right? At, this is at the very minimum. We might, Rafe is gonna um, talk about this nice recorder that he has. And those, these are great. I mean, they're far better for recording sound. Am I not in frame? No. Um, they're far better for recording sound, but even with just a small camera, a small digital camera like this, we can get a lot of that information. And you can get other sites of uh, fun behavioral data too. This is a Cassina. Uh, these are the frogs that go boop, 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 all around Africa. And they, and they run. They don't hop like normal frogs. And so just these sort of basic uh, behavioral data, like these are also tadpoles. Um, that, you know, just very useful to have a small camera around all the time because you never know what type of things you're going to get to see. Uh, so for the most part, um, while we're in the field, when we take photographs, we usually have some sort of dedicated space for taking photographs. What Rafe showed you yesterday was, um, you know, he would, he'll set up in a sort of a, a space within a campsite. Usually it's cleared out. Right, so that it's not, it's not on the edge of the forest, which is a bad idea for a place to take pictures. You want to take it in the middle of some sort of very large open area, right, so that if the frog jumps, you have at least one chance to catch it before it disappears in the forest. The same with you know, snakes, the same with lizards, is that you don't want to start taking your pictures like in the forest with a thing because it's going to immediately disappear, right? Tychodinas in Africa are famous for this. They jump once and they're gone. So we take some other precautions sometimes in the field. So for instance, we use our prep tent sometimes for photography. So we zip up the prep tent and then we take pictures of frogs inside the tent so that if it's a tychodina, that if it jumps, it just hits the edge of the tent and we can catch it again. Um, we also, oh, I'll come back to another thing here in a second. You'll see uh, this little cage, which I'll talk about in a moment. So, you know, normally when we're in the field, we will stabilize our, um, our photographs by using a tripod. And this is, you know, not a little digital handheld camera, but this is a larger SLR camera with a flash on it. And, you know, that's, that's these, these type of cameras like this, which are expensive and they can get, generate great photographs, but you can also generate really great specimen photographs just using a camera like this as well. So don't think that you're limited just because you don't have a larger SLR. And Rafe mentioned yesterday um, taking pictures on white background. So we use this in the field a lot. We like to have uh, images of things in semi-natural states, right, with leaves behind them and, and sticks behind them. But this is not, you know, a picture of them in the field. This is sort of recreated, you know, where we are. We put some leaves together, some sticks together, and then we put the frogs or lizards on top of that. We also do it on these white backgrounds, and these are just simply white pieces of plastic, and they're very lightweight, and we can roll them up and put them in our backpack. And I also, we've started using this. This is a cage. That is this. So you'll see this in the field. These are super lightweight. These are just little plastic terraria that are just made of plastic pipes with a mesh cage around it. And so a lot of times what we'll do in the field is, um, We'll put a piece of plastic in here like this, um, or we'll put uh, leaves in it like this. And then, you know, a lot of the photographs that I showed yesterday like, like this are actually taken inside of this, right? And the nice part about having this little enclosure for those of us that work on things that will jump and leave very quickly, uh, if they jump, for the most part, you know, in most directions when they jump, they're not going anywhere. They're just still in the cage. And so it gives us a little bit of chance uh, to work with these animals and not be really worried that we're going to be losing them, especially if you end up doing field work by yourself, right? So those of you that might go into the field with just one or two people, you know, you really need, you know, as many opportunities as you can to not lose the specimens because there's only one of you doing field work. And when I first started doing field work, I just did it by myself. So it's nice having, you know, some sort of system like this. And, you know, this is how we often take pictures. This is more or less just a little, a small camera. This is not a big fancy camera, a headlamp and some leaves in a cage. And you can generate, you know, nice images. This is one on a white background. This is a lizard we'll see in a white background. 
Sometimes we get photographs, uh, we get specimens, as Rafe mentioned, that are dead. You know, we showed a Varanus, a big monitor lizard yesterday. This is obviously only the front end of a snake. Uh, we get brought a lot of dead snakes uh, when we work in the field, because people are usually just killing them in villages. But even those, you can pose in ways to get semi-natural looking photographs off of them. Another, another trick that we use sometime in the field, this is a, not a fish, or sorry, not a frog, but this is a catfish. Um, it is a fish. This is a picture taken in a small, very small glass box, right? And what we'll do is we'll fill it with a little bit of water, we'll put a white background, or you can even put leaves inside of it, and then we'll use that and we'll photograph through the side of it to get pictures of things that are more comfortable in water, right? And we have a lot of frogs that are like that and also fish. Uh, we also use that glass case to take pictures of the undersides of frogs that like to stick to leaves and things like that. And so this is a tree toad that we'll see. It's a little dark, but they have these wonderfully webbed feet that have these dark pads on their toes. And so this is a really interesting part of their biology that we like to take pictures of, but it's hard when the frog is sitting, you know, like this, you can't see that. So they will, a lot of tree frogs will stick on the glass and just having just, even if it's just a a sheet of glass that you can carefully pack in your bag and they'll sit on, the, on it and you can take a picture from the other side it can actually give you some really nice photographs to show you characteristics of the animals. And some tree frogs are essentially transparent so you can see their organs when you're looking this way. We also sometimes, if you have literally nothing else, if you're collecting specimens, you probably have a fixing tray and we'll talk about that um, while we're out in the field. We have these plastic boxes that we use for preserving specimens. If you rinse it out, so you get out the formalin from it, you can rinse it out some. You can at the very least take pictures of water, uh, take pictures of specimens. This is a tadpole of a cassina, the running frog I showed you. And you'll see that they have these really red and orange tails. Those colors disappear almost immediately once you preserve them. And so at the very least, you can have some sort of setup of taking pictures in water uh, if, if you want to document the color and things like that. This is not the best photograph in the world, but you still can see the red and orange coloration. So one of the things that's important if you have people is to have some multiple people working together to take photos. This is a gray, uh, this is a large aquatic snake that we'll see probably in the field. Um, it's not that large, they get, they get a lot bigger than this. But of having one person essentially wrangle the snake while another person uh, takes pictures of it. So let's talk briefly just about um, types of field notes. Rafe is gonna talk much more in depth about details in field notes. Uh, this is sort of the most uh, full form for herpetology of description, really descriptive field notes. So this is, these are field numbers, a species name, at the top there's a date and a locality, GPS coordinates, elevation, the field numbers, the species ID, and then, you know, information about the coloration, the habitat, things like that. On the other, uh, this is another example of a, a even more descriptive field notes. On the other end of the spectrum are these type of notes, which are essentially field numbers, species ID, and then a few pieces of other information organized underneath, you know, locality, name, GPS coordinates, elevation, things like that. So this is really pretty minimal notes. Uh, but one reason is those are minimal is that we usually just supplement them now by digital records, sometimes even in the field. So we have, you know, Eric mentioned, you asked about um, organizing data, and Town mentioned Darwin Core. So we even organize just our field notes now by the Darwin Core standards because they're going to up, be uploaded eventually anyway to, the, to GBIF or something like that that uses those standards. And so while we're in the field, we use them. And uh, Town mentioned, you know, we, there's not a Darwin Core field for length of mammal ear. Uh, neither is there for length of a frog body. And a lot of those go into a standard field that's just called remarks. And so here you can see all these snout vent length measurements and weights and things like that that are put there. Yeah. You record them in the standard yeah. But you're doing that in Excel. In, in this case, just for in the field, because we're not, yeah, as Town mentioned, Excel's not great for more than 50,000 specimens, but I have not yet had a field expedition that generated 50,000 specimens. So usually we're just talking about, it would be an awesome field trip, but uh, usually we just have, you know, 1,000, 2,000 specimens. And so Excel, at least for organizing in the field, is useful, but for long term, it doesn't work very well. I really hope we have an opportunity to hear several different teams giving us the kind of knowledge they take in the field. So we, it may not be the same, but we, there are some Pieces of information, yeah. And so the pieces of information that we tend to take in the field that are probably consistent among all of us are, you know, we have some sort of field identifier that's here. We have a genus ID, a species ID. And in this case, these are basically Darwin Core. This is a 
country, the province, a full description of the locality that has the verbal description and in this case the latitude and longitude, the collectors, the date, the elevation, and then these are remarks. And we had, there's other fields that we collect too. Um, but I think probably for us, dates, you know, at least the date, the place, the GPS coordinates, the names, those are common to all of us. And then each field has its own subset of things that it also collects. Uh, and Rafe and both Town will mention, or Rafe and uh, Mark mentioned, you know, things that are specific to audio recordings about behaviors and things like that that are not really part of the standard normally for specimen collection. I have several students here today because we have issues with way yep. Oh yeah, so we can we can talk more about that today for Yep. So that gives you an introduction and then Rafe is going to tell, tell you even more sort of detailed versions of types of um, information about habitat and things like that. So what about keeping track of photos? And so different people have very different approaches to this, but I think they're, they're all maybe in the same realm. So this is just, the next few slides are actually just images taken straight from a file, a folder I had of images taken from the field. And so there starts as a photo that's of a field number, and well, there should be a frog, it jumped though. And then there's a frog, and then there's a frog, and then there's a frog. Those are all the same individual that follow that field tag. Then there's a new field tag, a different frog, a different, that's same, 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 new tag, different frog, <coughs> right? And at the very least, it's a way of organizing the files as they're getting added to your computer. You have an image of a field tag, image of this frog, and then as soon as you see a new field tag, you know, okay, the images after that are the next frog. And so as soon as we're back with a computer, then we can actually change the file name so that they reflect the field tags, right? Um, another way of doing this is something that Rafe does. So Rafe will, for instance, take a picture um, of the, in this case, this is a dead, dead Sicilian, right? Uh, with a field tag in the image. So we do this also, so we'll have an image of a preserved animal or a recently dead animal with the field tag. Rafe will sometimes also take a picture of the living animal, euthanize it, and you'll see the color change immediately, right? This is why it's really important, especially for amphibians, uh, but also, you know, Mark mentioned for birds that once they die, their color changes pretty dramatically. So you want to be able to have a picture of them in life or at least immediately after they die. So Rafe will take a picture in life, euthanize it, and then immediately take a picture, like the next files on the camera are one with a field tag, the dorsal and the ventral view, and then it would be the next frog in life, right? Um, so just trying to have some sort of standardized way in which you do it maybe is the most important thing. And it's really, you know, you'll notice in both versions that the field number somehow appears in an image associated with the specimens, either sequential files or it's appearing in literally the same image. So those, those are just different strategies that we use. So these images can be really important not only for specimens, but imagine that you had a picture like this and for whatever reason you, you didn't collect it, right? You couldn't collect it in the field. So as uh, Jacob mentioned, there's now a lot of online uh, sort of repositories of citizen science or just observation data. So eBird is sort of the gold standard, but then there's other flexible databases that have uh, developed that are, are for other taxa. So iNaturalist is one. Um, which has some pluses and minuses, but largely uh, ha is, a, is a way of pulling together data for many, many different types of taxa. And so I'm gonna step out of frame here, but it doesn't matter to see me in this. So I'm gonna just show you an example of um, sort of what it looks like quickly. If you just keep it focused there, Kate, that would be great. Um, let me just mirror real quick. So this is um, what the iNaturalist site looks like now. And while Jacob was talking, I just did a quick search uh, for that little box is reptiles and Cameroon. And in Cameroon, you know, there are actually quite a few reptile records here. Uh, and mostly this turned out to be because there was one or two people that came that were very interested in chameleons. Uh, and chameleons are probably among the more identifiable here for reptiles. They're, they're fairly straightforward to identify. And so here's a bunch of observational records of reptiles going across here, and you'll see that there's even some around in Boya. And in this case, most of these observations are backed up by an image, uh, which is really important for amphibians and reptiles and many groups because they're really hard to identify. 
And so without an image, it's almost hopeless to identify them. And even for a lot of frogs with an image, it's still hard to identify. Um, but there are these platforms like iNaturalist that you, know, you can upload many different types of data to. 